um, Sharon's association with Multnomah County Bridge Shop started in the 1980s when she began writing news articles and books about the river crossings and the bridges in Portland, Oregon. Um, in 1991, she started her 20 year career as a bridge tour guide, taking dozens of groups, probably hundreds of groups of adults and children into um, over the county's bridges. And by the mid 1990s, she helped the county put together a slideshow that helped <laughs> helped convince community groups to support and fund efforts to upgrade aging bridges. And at the same time, the county actually granted Sharon the first ever permit to take tours down into the Morrison Bridge Bascule Pit to watch the openings. So, and you also might know her as the author of the Portland Bridge book. So I just am excited to introduce Sharon Wood Wartman. Thank you so much. Well, this is fun. I feel like it's a privilege to be here with my community advisory design group, the Sea Dogs. But then at my age, I think it's a privilege to be anywhere. So it's good to be here. And we'll talk a little bit about Burnside and other things as well in the bigger context. And they're letting me run my own board here. That's pretty amazing IT work. So here we go. And I only have a half an hour, and I will say that if this goes pretty fast, the county's putting this show up on the website so you can go back and take a look, okay? So in this half hour, we're gonna see where the bridge fits into the world of the lore, <clears throat> what I call the WRBs, and where the WRBs fit into the larger world. So we're gonna learn a little bit about the history of the 26th Burnside and its predecessor bridge, the 1894 Burnside. And we look closely at the changes and challenges during the 1926 Burnside century long evolution as we move forward in design of the third Burnside. <clears throat> so first of all, we have to have the definition of a bridge according to the Federal Highway Administration any structure 20 feet or longer carrying a highway load in the US, that's 600,000 roadway bridges inspected by the federal government every two years. And that 600,000 includes approach ramps. As you can see in this great photo that the Oregonian gave us permission to use. So this is the busiest interchange in Oregon. This is I-5 and I-84, and you can see burn sides just off to the right. So here it is, this bridge that's 97 years old. So the first bridge in the whole world was probably a tree. Two people need to get across the canyon. He said, honey, will you cut down that tree? And they walked across on a beam bridge, okay? Just plain old tree, that's it. Probably the first bridge in the whole world. So if you add triangles, on both sides of that beam bridge, then you have a truss bridge. So the county knows a lot about old truss bridges, including Burnside. So we're pretty lucky in Portland. We have all three main bridge types and all three main movable bridge types. So we'll just go over them quickly, arch, and then a beam girder truss, that's all the same type. And then we have suspension. So St. John's is our only major suspension bridge in Oregon. So our movable types, you guys, you all know this, right? Bascule, swing, vertical left. So different agencies care for the more than 8,000 public roadway bridges in Oregon, all of which also must be inspected every two years. The largest are the fixed span and movable bridges on the lower 26 miles of the Willamette River. So that's counting from Oregon City down. So here they are, and you'll see Burnside is right at the bend of the river where it makes its 45 degrees turn on its last miles to meet the Columbia. So here's Multnomah County's bridge shop, my place east end of the Hawthorne Bridge. 
And here we have bridge operators, maintenance specialists, mechanics, inspectors, and engineers manage and maintain 20 smaller bridges and five big bridges in addition to the really, really big Burnside Bridge. So here are those five. There's Savi Island under construction getting its new bridge, Broadway, Morrison, Hawthorne, and St. Um, Selwyn. So you all have a <coughs> little map by your table here. It's the same picture this is. It shows 22 bridges um, that we are very inextricably linked to as citizens of this town. And the 22 are all three main bridge types and all three movable types. So what I say to the 3,316 third graders in the 64 elementary schools in the Portland Public School District who will study bridges as part of this year's social studies curriculum if they ever go back to school. Listen up, you future taxpayers. You are inheriting an aging infrastructure and it's not held together nor maintained by duct tape. <laughs> County has one of these parked. We would tell them the bridges are susceptible to damage caused by nature and human error. And this is why design and maintenance are so important and it speaks to our group because we think about, well, what will this bridge be susceptible to? So one thing we don't do in Portland areas, we don't use salt for snow removal because salt causes corrosion. Our big corroder is birds, believe it or not. Um, people tend to overload bridges and they kind of run into them. Yeah. Two spans on the Tennessee River, gone. And this bridge taken out by Hurricane Irene in 2011. I'm telling you, design's important. And of course, there's always earthquakes. And this is only a 6.9. This was Kobe in 1995. So we don't want Kobe or Northridge or Anchorage or any other earthquake scenarios in Portland. We want a bridge that's going to be here. So in this part of the world, we wear our bridges close to our heart. <laughs> when the big one comes, we want an earthquake ready Burnside so that getting across the Willamette will be possible. Today, roughly 800,000 people live and work west of the Willamette in the greater Portland area. So Burnside Street, that's pretty amazing. So 18 miles long from Gresham past the Piddock Block to the Washington County line at Barnes Road. So Ed and I, there was a difference of opinion how long that street is, so we went out and drove it the other day. So somewhere between 18 and 19 miles is close enough. So straight shot. So um, you see the bicyclist over there, mid-span, ready to go into West Portland from the east side. So this bridge divides the city north from south, east from west. I call it the geographical heart of Portland. Another fact, both the 1894 and the 1926 Burnside were built on unceded and occupied land and water that rest on the traditional territories of the Multnomah, Chinook, Cowlitz, and Clackamas people and other tribes. So here we are, a modern day history of the 1926 Burnside Bridge, one of three WRBs added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2012. So here it is back in the day when we actually had big ships coming up the Willamette River. Before bridges, people crossed the Willamette in canoes, sternwheelers, and ferries. This was the last ferry on the lower Willamette. It was called the Capels, and that's the old Selwood Bridge. It stopped running in 1925, a year before the <coughs> our Burnside opened. The first Willamette River Bridge were built by private companies designed for pedestrians, bicycles, horse and buggies, streetcars, trolleys, and railroads. The first bridge across the Lower Willamette was the 1887 Morrison, made of iron and wood. It was a toll bridge. So one horse and a rider cost 10 cents, loose sheep and hogs, five cents. And they think cars are bad. Hmm. 
Okay, so here's that Morrison Bridge during the great flood of 1894. This is just a month before the first Burnside Bridge opened in 1894. So this bridge is still together, but it's barely above water. So here's the 1894 Burnside. So does anybody know anything about this bridge? Yeah? Yeah. So you can still drive across this bridge. It's not all put together, but there's one big truss across the Bull Run River and one bigger truss across the Sandy River. So Ed and I walked, uh, got to drive over the Bull Run. Is that right, Ed? Bull Run? Yep, Bull Run. I forget where we are sometimes. Just uh, yesterday. So slow-moving slow swing spans fell out of favor because the central pier was in the middle of the river and impeded flow of traffic. Next came the modern-day vertical lift and Basco bridges prized for their zippier movement. Captains didn't have to wait. And Basco bridges allowed for free passage for river craft of any height. So this is uh, the BNS. Does anybody even know this bridge? Because we don't drive cars across it. A lot of people don't even know it's here, but you, this group would. So this is uh, just pre-1989. By the way, this is a Ed Wortman construction project. Ed was the construction engineer for the replacement of that bridge from an old swing span to a humongous vertical lift. You can see that train looks like a toy train. That's a big bridge. So here it is raised with the Savi Island Bridge floating up to get put into place. So the city of Portland built both the old Hawthorne that's still standing and the 1913 Broadway. And then the Oregon legislature, in its wisdom, turned the business of Willamette River Bridge building and maintenance over to Multnomah County. The extant Burnside is one of a trio built by the county in the 20s. So then there is Ross Island and Selwood, Anybody remember the Lovejoy Viaduct? Yeah, all part of what we call Old Portland, located at the west end of the Broadway Bridge. So Multnomah County also, who knew, that built the St. John's Bridge, opened in 31, but now ODOT is responsible for St. John's and Ross Island. So in the Burnside Bridge's 97-year history, world population has ballooned from two billion in 1926 to what we know today as the eight billion. Hi, Rick. So here we have this graph. Multnomah County put this graph together. It's a great graph, shows population. But what stands out for me is that vehicle registration in Oregon when Burnside opened was 207,000, and today it's 3.2 million. It's a little crowded out there. The 1926 bridge with approaches costs four and a half million. That's 80 million in today's dollar. That sounds pretty cheap, doesn't it, Megan? <laughs> so it was designed by the engineering firm Hedrick and Kremers following political drama, and we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> the two were replaced by the internationally famous bridge engineer Gustav Lindenthal, shown here early in his career. So he was the former New York Commissioner of Bridges. He was a big deal. He came to Portland to save Multnomah County in the last years of his career. So here's Burnside Street, widening demo, looking east from Southwest First Street, 1925-26. This uh, photo comes out of Steve Dodder's collection. Anybody know Steve? He's got a lot of photographs. So um, what I've been able to turn up is that this width of the Burnside went from 60 feet to more than 150 feet in width. So that was a lot of buildings and a lot of sidewalk displacement. So here's that bridge under construction, giant bridge. So they built the superstructure and then they put everything around it and things got hidden. This is a great photo. Um, you can't, I don't, it's really hard to see here, but that's the concrete counterweight um, that does the whole job of moving that bridge, and it's about to be encased and not to be seen again for another century, unless you go down into the pit. Notice the trolley poles in the center of the lift span, and these girders. I mean, we're talking girders here. 
system engineers, and rivets, rivets, and more rivets. So here's an interesting fact. The structural steel for the 26 Burnside was fabricated by American Bridge. And American Bridge is one of the contractors for our new bridge. How's that for passing down genetics? <laughs> so here it is, getting ready for opening day, May 28, 1926. So I found a document that said they didn't see any need for lane striping. If they needed lane striping later, the police would take care of it. Why well, I wonder how soon they got over to that. So here it is, opening day, May 26, 1926. I love this photo. So we're looking west, um, and those are the traffic gates that soon disappeared because they were a lot more expensive to replace than the nice bascule gates that we have today. So this is, get this, Strauss patented trunnion bascule. So there is a little connects bridge up there. You can see exactly how it works. So the bridge lifts up, counterweight goes down. Doesn't pivot, it just kind of goes down. And when I say down, I mean down because that thing weighs four million pounds. So this was the largest, first largest first large scale bascule in the US with a concrete deck on its lift span. And it was the largest double leaf deck bascule constructed at the time. So um, we've had some conversations about why did they pick a concrete deck for a bascule bridge that needed a four million pound counterweight? So we think it's because this was the 12th bridge and all the other bridges, the decks rotted because they made the decks out of fir trees, and fir trees don't last very long, and probably because it was the cheapest bid. So here we have that bridge deck. It's a humongous bridge. In comparison, the Morrison has a see-through deck, so that's because it's made of steel and weighs about half as much as Burnside's lift span. So I've already told you about the counterweights, but I can't let this subject go. Counterweights go down, bridge deck lifts up. So here, this is the spot that is so hard to photograph. So this is the concrete counterweight. It says it's just a big brick. And on top of it is the maintenance walkway. So over here, this is a wonderful photograph by James Norman of the Historic American Engineering Record. So that's the counterweight to the left. It hangs from two hinges we call trunnions. So that counterweight is 15 feet thick at the base, weighs what I told you. And that's the same as 35, 40 foot long Greyhound buses. That's a big brick. And they are 36 feet tall, the height of a three story building and they measure 57 feet wide, the same length as your standard bowling alley lane. Huge. So by comparison, this is the Morrison's counterweight. So the Morrison, it lifts very different. So the bridge deck lifts up and the counterweight swings around like this. And it weighs half of Burnside's counterweight. Another interesting thing about Burnside is it's double intersection lattice truss configuration, unique in Oregon. I'm still not sure why or what that means, but we're unique. So this is a pattern for a bridge building curriculum. And so you can see it's a subdivided. Here's one of my favorite parts about this bridge. It sits on a cluster of 360 40 foot tall Douglas fir trees driven into the riverbed, and it supports each of the Burnside Bridge's two bascule piers. But then there are 12 other piers that sit on those same tree trunks, including the two piers under the ends of the truss spans at the riverbanks. And there are also Douglas fir trees under another 10 piers sitting under the approach spans. There's a whole forest holding that bridge up. Wooden dolphins positioned below the operator houses are designed to deflect, divert river debris and watercraft floating downriver from banging into the bascule pier. 
So this is super fun. If ODOT ever opens its Region 1 museum again, or its building, you can actually go in and pretend you're opening the 1926 Burnside because this was the opening mechanism until it was upgraded in 1998. Talking about making an electrical system last, John Henriksen, I'm telling you. <laughs> so just like a streetcar, there were two of them. I mean, it was humongous. So then technology changed, so they put in an opening control panel, started in 1999, but that was outdated, and the technology changing fast, we come up with a touchscreen panel installed in 2003. So this is what it looks like up there today. There's an operator. So when a vessel requests an opening or when the river elevation is 12, the county sends up an op operator and a few other times as well. So this is what it looks like up there. Very interesting. Operator has all kinds of cameras. Operator can walk out on his or her porch. I think this tower looks like a lighthouse. I think it's a beacon up there. I think it's wonderful. So this is the West End Circular Staircase. It's all gorgeous too. So the East Tower Saver Circular Stairway is an empty shell used for storage. So how many architects in the room tonight? One, two, three, four? And maybe wannabe architects or something? No? Okay. So it was the first downtown bridge to be designed with the help of an architect. So the Italian Renaissance style towers reflect the early 20th century city beautiful movement that called for adding architectural ornamentation to engineering designs. So the prominent Portland architectural firm Hoodling and Dugan designed the bridge operator towers, the cantilevered vaulted arches under the towers, the bridge operator porches, and the distinctive railing. Those vaulted arches are amazing. So the, I think I counted eight of them. So, and they're on both sides of the bridge. These are the legs on the porch, all designed. And this railing, of course, lighter than the concrete balusters we see on the approach spans because you have to lift up that spinner span. I put that umbrella out there for scale. Do you think it'd help? So 1926 precast concrete with many originals since replaced also made of precast concrete. So the county keeps these balusters up. So there are an estimated 3,000 of these old and new balusters seen on the bridge today. I know for a fact there are 1,501 on the north side because I counted them. So <laughs> if anybody gets a different number, let me know. <laughs> and there is other architectural detail up there that you just don't notice because you're trying to get across the bridge before it opens. You should hear when the operator rings that bell. Boy, do they go fast. Uh, fencing put up by ODOT a couple years ago. They didn't like people throwing things off the side onto their freeway. When the bridge opened in 26, its trusses were painted a light gray and later green. And then in 66, the county hired Portland architect Lewis Crutcher to recommend a color scheme, and he did. And that's how we got our yellow ochre. Didway's Burnside has other beauty spots, not all of them obvious at all times, but they are wonderful. So the Willamette Light Brigade's efforts to see the bridge architecturally lighted resulted in the twin turreted operator towers and cantilevered arches being illuminated in time for the 2012 Rose Festival. How's that? Nice, Spirit of Portland. Ed and I showed up at the harbor wall to take a picture. We didn't know that we wanted to go down there at nine o'clock at night, but it turned out all right. Just about the time we pulled up, there was a Spirit of Portland. How's that for timing? 
Another cool thing about this bridge, not everybody knows, is the wonderful skateboard do-it-yourself park under the East End. And look at this photo of what it looks like today. I was standing on some kind of a ledge. People around me were very nervous when they saw me got on that ledge. <laughs> but it paid off because we <coughs> cut the skateboard guy right there. So last, more than any other downtown bridge, Burnside is the community gathering spot, a fact not likely to change for the earthquake-ready Burnside. So here's marchers in 1930s. Who knows how many marches have taken across this bridge. And here's Rose Festival in the 40s. Here's recent Rose Festival. Here's the George Floyd Lion Diane of 2020. And teachers striking most recently. So we're going to close. What time do we have there, Brandy? Huh? Okay. We're doing well? OK. So I'll read these poems. They're by nine-year-olds. Nine Poetry can never hurt a presentation. <laughs> this is a persona poem, Bridges. Stretching across the rivers, carrying cars, trucks, and trains, strong, old, and reliable, I feel like I'm on top of the world. And this one by Benjamin Grosscup, age nine. Bridges long, bridges short, bridges tall, bridges small, bridges up, bridges down, bridges helping all around. So um, the slideshow was put together with the help of a lot of people, 20 different sources for images. And I'll just close by reading my special gratitude list. Thank you to Megan Neal. Cassie Davis, Aisha Gazul, bridge operator Joseph, Dennis Corwin of the Portland Spirit, who made it possible for Ed and I to be on that ship during the day so we could get current photos, Cole Haver, Robert Hadlow, Therese Bottomley, Steve Dodderer, Tony Lester, Scott Daniels, Robin Lodster Ludwig, and especially Ed Wartman without whose above and beyond contribution to this show would not have gone on, at least not this version. Thank you. All right. Well, it's hard to compete and follow that act right there. So. Um, thank you, everyone. We can, if you are a committee member or advisory um, group member, you can, I can, okay. Um, you might want to join us back at the table. Um, and um, they might be getting their, their dinner. Um, It was nice while it lasted. <laughs> a little light today. All right. So we might have a few more people trickling in, um, but by my clock, it's six o'clock. So we'll just get started. Um, and yeah, so this is already meeting number three um, of the Community Design Advisory Group. So thank you all for being here tonight. Um, and I just wanted to get us started. Um, just really quickly, our agenda, we'll have our um, quick, some quick opening remarks, welcome, introduction, go through our housekeeping pretty quickly because what we really wanna get to um, is the evaluation criteria review. We'll spend most of that time in small groups. And so um, kind of where you're sitting is part of your group and we'll help explain it all. But basically um, you're gonna stay put, your facilitators are gonna move. Um, so it's gonna be rotation from them. So you don't have to worry about anything. You can just sit and chill out and think about the evaluation criteria and your thoughts about that. Um, really, we're thinking about what's important to keep, what's missing. So just building off of your homework that 
was assigned at the last meeting. Um, and then we will come back together and report out as the large group. And then if we do have anyone here um, from the public or online who would like to give comments, um, we will have a public comment period. And then we'll have some next steps and closing remarks before we wrap up. And this will be our last meeting for 2023. And then we'll come back in January of next year. So um, if there is anyone attending virtually, I think there are a few people. Um, we do have closed captioning um, and also on YouTube if you're watching through the live stream. And questions can always be submitted if you think of something at burnsidebridge at moltco.us. Um, and we can skip this one probably. <laughs> um, so I think if people are interested in providing comments, um, we have that. Um, and then again, safety, if we need to evacuate the building, we'll go outside together and we'll meet at one location just um, to, to keep track of everyone. Um, emergency exits are here and here. Um, please, if we do have to exit, notice that there are <laughs> easels, so please don't trip. Um, and you all know the protocols. We talked a lot about them in our first meeting, but try to raise your hand or your table tent. Um, if you have questions or wanna speak, um, speak clearly in towards the microphone so that we can hear you online. And um, again, because we have those microphones, try to limit um, side conversations or additional noises. And we are recording these meetings, as you all know, your famous YouTube stars, so good job. Um, we're here to be curious, to think together, ask questions, please be respectful, um, and let's share differences of opinion in a polite and respectful way, and that's fine. Um, and I will try my hardest to get you out of here on time. We have done so, so far, and Sharon helped us stay on schedule, so we're, we're good. Um, and I might just keep us moving along so you'll hear my, my timer go off several times tonight. Um, okay, Jen. Um, so it would be great. We're in a little bit of a different order. Um, and so I would love to, for have, to have us go around the table and just say your name and pronouns and your affiliation. And I think this is our first meeting that Bob is here. So Bob, if you, um, the others also had said just a little bit about themselves and why they're interested in joining, being part of the group. So I'm wondering if you could start us off and maybe we'll, we'll go around the table this way. Okay. Everybody, Bob Hastings, he, him. Um, I retired from TriMet in 2021. I'm an architect and uh, was there at the agency for about 23 years. Um, the, probably the notable thing was that I was very involved with the Tillicum Crossing and helped with both the uh, selection of the uh, design architects, the artists, and also the uh, design engineers. And then also when we did the construction process too. So stayed through with that project all the way from start to finish and pleased that when I was heading over today, my grandson noticed that the lights were coming on at Telecom Crossing, which I breathe a sigh of relief. Because uh, <laughs> technical things can happen. Um, so um, uh, I've also worked a lot in the city in Portland, uh, downtown, uh, certainly with the uh, transit projects and also worked in earlier on in the first process uh, when we were reviewing uh, the project from an urban design perspective. Uh, Aaron Welton, he, him, Portland State University. Guinevere Milius, she, her, Sunnyside Neighborhood Association. Valerie Schiller, she, her, Multnomah County, Bicycle and Pedestrian Citizen Advisory Committee. Patrick Sullivan, he, him, pronouns, and Sarah Architect. Fred Cooper, Laura Horse Neighborhood Association and uh, Native Americans in the Portland area. Susan Lindsay, Buckman Community Association. Brian Kimura, he, him. Uh, I'm representing uh, the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. Anthony Jackson, he, him pronouns, and I'm a community member at large. My name's Eric Swinson. I'm with the Portland Saturday Market. Gabriel Ray, Burnside Skate Park. Jackie Tate, she, her pronouns, uh, community member at large. 
Ed Wortman, he, him, a community member. Ian Siren, he there, he they, community member at large. Carol Gossett, she, her, and I am with OMSI. Wonderful, thank you everyone. And I am really sorry I messed up. I'm not perfect. <laughs> I know, and neither are we, <laughs> anyone. Um, I realized I forgot to ask you if you wanted to share any of your homework bonus extra credit if you went on any of the bridges. So feel free to jump in if you did do any of those bonus visits um, to any of the bridges and if you have anything that you want to share um, or anything else about that. You're like, we already did it. We saw all the bridges. Sharon gave us the tour. Yeah, yeah, Eric. Um, so I think I mentioned this the last time, but our building at the Portland Saturday Market where our offices and member storage is, is right. It's actually, they cut our building in half to build the bridge and we are moving out of it. And so in January is gonna be our last uh, month there. I don't know if you guys want to take another field trip, but you can actually see some of the reinforcement work that they did. And you can see like, I mean, it's in pretty dire straits. I mean, you can see the water running through the cracks. I mean, it's pretty like, to see like the state of it from the underside, because we also have the Multnomah County storage that's actually, they call it the MCAT storage there, um, County Access Transit storage. And it goes actually all the way to the other side. So you get to see, uh, I mean, it, you, you get to see the condition of it like pretty, I mean, it's pretty dramatic. You know, it's surprising we're still in the building, actually. <laughs> I see lots of people like, ooh. <laughs> well, there's an entrance to the Shanghai tunnels under there, too. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. All right. We should have done that in October. I see a thumbs up, so maybe we can organize that. Thanks, Eric, for that reminder. Yeah, I know. We all really like the bridge tour, so I think people are up for more. So cool. Anyone else want to share? I don't don't mean to put you on, on the spot, but just wanted to check in. Okay. All right. Um, so we're going to move in to the evaluation criteria. You've all been waiting for this part. So this, I just wanted to, um, to give you a quick rundown, uh, but I, first I want to hear from Megan, I think, um, just to give us a little um, intro about what you're doing, why you're doing this, why are you here tonight? Hi, good, good evening everyone. I just want to uh, provide a quick status of where we are with the project. Um, you may have read recently and mentioned from our last meeting that we have selected a contractor for the project. We're eagerly working to get through the negotiation process and get them under contract by the first of this uh, year, next year. Um, so we're really excited to finally get some actual contractor input on the project to help us uh, decide what is the best structure type for the bridge. Um, so we're really eager to get them on board in addition to continuing our work here at the Community Design Advisory Group and get everybody's recommendation in um, from each point of view about what's the best uh, uh, for the earthquake ready Burnside Bridge. So on the next slide. So I just wanted to note that um, as you've noticed in the evaluation criteria, there's a whole section about cost and constructability. And I just wanted to note that um, we are working through some of that information and data over the next few months along with the contractor. And we're going to be bringing that information to this group um, so that you can be informed, weigh that information against the additional criteria that you are working through this evening. Uh, again, and as a reminder, it, it, we need to, the county needs to be weighing many, cons, uh, be considering many factors in the project to ultimately arrive um, at a decision on structure types. So we should be back to this group um, in the um, late spring, early summer, with additional information on on uh, all these elements on the screen. So I just wanted to sh share a brief status update on what we'll be doing while you guys are doing your work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, 
So uh, thank you, Sharon. Wait, where's Sharon? She's, oh, there she is. <laughs> thank you, Sharon, again. That was really wonderful, inspirational. And I'll never forget when my kids came back from your bridge tours. Both of them were so excited. And the kind of influence you've had on all these kids that grew up in our city is just a marvelous gift. So thank you for all that. Um, last time we provided an overview of the UDOG draft <clears throat> that led to a discussion about the, how the criteria would be used. And we said that this could be a framework for discussion. Um, and later we said, we don't necessarily want to rewrite the whole thing, although I know authors in the group might tend to do so. Um, we wanted to honor the input that was given before it. So, but we're really open to hearing what you have to say about it and your insights and thoughts. And some of the criteria is not differentiating between bridge types, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it and what else is it useful for. And then does it help the bridge team, the designers, how to apply this criteria to the rest of the structure? Of course it does. And then is it a way to develop language around aesthetics and our values? And then is it shared internally with this group, but is it also externally shared for anybody who would like to know more about the community values and qualities that we would like to see? So um, this is the de beginning of the design process with all of you, the bridge architects, the contractors that are also building on the impressive amount of cross-disciplinary work and citizen input that's already been underway. So tonight, we're just going to focus on the two categories, uh, urban design, <coughs> excuse me, urban site context and experience, and visual character and aesthetics of the bridge. And we have to remember, and this is probably bothering some of you, uh, about category three, the cost and construction impacts to users. Of course, it's fundamental to any bridge project. And we're counting on you to make recommendations to the county. You don't have to decide the bridge type, but they really are going to take what you say very seriously. So uh, we'll have more information and discussions in the coming months. Um, did all of you get to read Jason Halstead's comments? Pretty much everybody did? No? Some did, some didn't. Um, he's not here tonight with us, but he asked, how can we evaluate criteria when we haven't seen any designs? And for all of us who are skilled visual learners, sometimes we feel like we're missing things. We're missing the data. We're missing the elevations and renderings. And we're only looking at diagrams of bridges right now, bridge types. So perhaps we're sort of at a crossroads of a chicken and egg situation. So I'll ask you, can we ev evaluate visuals without discussing words and values in advance as a group? That's what we're being asked to do. So you, it's more of a conceptual exercise. Sometimes people find it's really frustrating that addressing project aesthetics is not more linear. It's like if you do this step, then you go through that step, and it, it comes to a, a, a satisfy, satisfying outcome, which isn't true in design. And maybe some people are like, well, I'll know it when I see it, you know? I'll know it whether I like it or not. And people rightly sense that there's a tension about community expectations versus cost. And of course, this is true. And the apprehension with not having you know, the answer to these solutions might uh, be there for a period of time. But please understand that our expressed values, our discussions will inspire creativity in the team and guide aesthetic challenges. And that's its own kind of problem solving. It isn't just about what it takes to build the bridge and make it stand, but to have it fit into our city. So um, we're, we're just going to live with that for a little while. We have to let that hang while we go through the rest of the process. So in the coming months, you'll see an iterative process of design studies and alternatives. And the architects are going to illustrate and they have 3D models and lots of ways for you to look at the um, long span bridge types along with everything else on the bridge. So it's designed, it's sculpted, materials are applied. And rest assured, there will be trade-offs with pros and cons. 
and we will be getting you the right level of information that you need to make those recommendations. So I think maybe some people are feeling a little frustrated about that right now. So um, let's not have me talk anymore. We want to hear what you have to say. So there's four stations. Let's see, there's, how do they go? <laughs> One, two, three, four? Okay, <laughs> all right. She's got this all figured out, but we're anxious to hear from you. Yeah, thank you. Brandy, if I might ask a question yeah, before we dive sure. in. Um, right now, the criteria, like just on the front page, boldly says it's type selection criteria. And I just wanted to be clear about, and especially with Jason's remarks, should we really be focusing on criteria that only apply to type selection? Or should we consider this criteria that we will also bring forward later on when we're discussing the aesthetics and those features during a separate further iteration. Do you want to speak to that, Carol? <laughs> I think what I was saying um, would be that as long as we're having these discussions, it doesn't hurt to talk about criteria that's important to the bridge overall. I don't think we need to just put the blinders on and say, well, you know, pedestrian access applies to all bridge types, so we don't need to think about that anymore. I think we need to think holistically about what makes the very best bridge, and perhaps through your recommendations on cable stay or uh, tide arch, you may be examining much more criteria than just that. So that's why we don't want to limit the discussion, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, I think that means to me, it, uh, that our discussion will be a little bit broader and that we'll probably looking to add more things that are specifically about the aesthetic discussion instead of just focusing on one type versus the other. Right. Okay. Can I just make one point of recognition? So yeah, because the urban design and aesthetic working group, the UDOG, the board, their focus was to get to thank you, the, what we see now, right? The girder, bascule, and then long span. That's the work that they got to. So that's why it says bridge type still, because that's just still, the, that's the original document they were working off of. And yes, your purview is beyond that. It's getting into more details and aesthetics. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions about it? Gwen, did you have, no, okay. All right, sounds like we're ready to break out. <laughs> Okay, so we have very complicated, detailed notes. So um, we want you to be able to speak to these different criteria. And so we have you sitting already in your groups. So um, our first group is um, this one right here um, with Bob and Carol and Ian and Ed. And you're just gonna stay here, so you don't have to do anything. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, our second group is um, going to start with the um, um, urban and site context and experience with criteria C and D. And that is at the other end of the table, and that includes Brian, Fred, Susan, and Anthony, and Patrick. Yeah, all of you are here today. Hooray, good job. And um, so you don't have to move either. So. Good work. Um, so then that means the rest of you have to move. So, sorry. Um, but so this side of the table is going to go up to that table um, up there. And you're gonna start with the visual aesthetics of the bridge with criteria A and B. And um, so you'll start up there. And then this side of the table, you're gonna go to that table that's kind of back off to the side and that's where you're gonna start and you'll start with um, visual aesthetics criteria C. So how this is gonna work is mm -hmm. you each have a comment form in your packet that you can write things down if you want to, notes that you can leave with us today. We have a lot in the back, so if you want to write a ton, that's fine. Um, we're gonna ask that you send any additional comments that you get through that you can't get through today might feel like maybe a little rushed or you know we don't have as much time as we would love to spend just talking through this but we want to be able to give you a chance to talk together and then also a chance to go home and think about it and process it a little bit more so at the end of the night i'm going to take pictures of all the flip charts and all the notes and i'll send that back out to you all so that if you 
do like to think things through a little bit longer, you can have that information to help you with that conversation. So um, we will be timing you. At your first and second stations, you'll have 15 minutes. At your third and fourth station, you're gonna have 10 minutes. And so I'll have a timer. I'll tell you when you're halfway through at your station, and then I'll tell you when it's time to transition. So don't worry too much about the time. Um, but the idea is that you're building off of other comments that others have said, um, because the facilitators are gonna rotate. So you'll be working with Cassie and Steve and Megan and Carol, and they're gonna bring the boards to your table and they're gonna say, okay, we just talked to group number one, now we're talking to you, group number three, about this um, evaluation criteria. Here's what they, the first group said, and now let's continue that conversation. So you'll be able to sort of hear from everyone tonight. Any questions about this just logistically? Yeah, Valerie. Why is it that we have more time at the first two stations than the other two? The idea is that you kind of get it out and hopefully then you're kind of just building on. Maybe there's less to build on. Um, hopefully that's the way it goes. Um, if not, that's okay. So um, yeah, that's the theory behind this. Any other questions? I'll walk you through it so you're not on your own. Um, and so I would ask the facilitators to try to go to your spot. Um, so Steve and Cassie can pull your um, display boards or your easels in. And um, yeah, I'll be ringing the bell every you know seven minutes or so. <laughs> um, so just to remind you where we're at. And then after we do this and you're all exhausted and your brains are tired, we'll have a five minute break <laughs> before we come back as a big group. So um, so I think we're ready to kind of move to our spots. So yeah, this side again goes up to the, to the um, over where Carol is okay. at number three. And then um, this side over here goes to that table over there by Megan.
Whew. Hopefully you're all energized by that exercise and not exhausted. Um, so we are gonna come back here and just hear how it went. So I think we're gonna start with um, group number one. We're gonna have the facilitators just tell us what they heard from you all, what takeaways they gathered, and then um, they're each gonna give just a quick report out, and then we'll open it up to the big group. Make sure to use your microphones um, for those listening virtually. And we'll just kind of go around the room if there's anything that they missed, um, if there was some big takeaway that you had, um, and I might call on the going around the table, um, but I don't want to put anyone on the spot. So um, if you're okay with that, we'll just kind of feel it out. So um, again, just put, put your name tense up um, when you want to speak, and maybe will it be easiest to give, give you the portable mic? So I think you're number one. Or Beth, you want to come up here? <laughs> I got, I got it. Okay, so group number one, the question was all about the urban site context experience on bridge versus below bridge. So uh, we didn't share anybody else's ideas with the group. So all of these are different, unique groups. Which is interesting is you're going to see some things that are common and some things that are unique. No surprise. So as we started asking the question about this, there were some, you know, all these ideas are different groups. So number one, this idea of understanding future development and activities uh, underneath the bridge and, and even possibly adjacent or on the bridge. The fact that aesthetics um, driven by the function of transportation, the importance of human scale elements on the bridge, and you're gonna hear that a lot. Um, idea that the, the current criteria was pretty thorough, so maybe not a lot to add. The idea that overlooks are important, and that's certainly a design element to be considered a strong desire for a gateway on the east and the west by this particular group. So this is where even with some constraints as well, the, the condition or the thought was to try to overcome even for a gateway experience on the west. Uh, but certainly a framing of the east side and the importance of the urban design under the bridge. Um, the next group talked about really a focus on, this, on the bridge being the center of the city, and you're gonna see that by quite a few of the groups. Uh, the value of this openness and the feel. The, I even get some background music. Um, the, uh, the, another, again, focus on the pedestrian human scale. Uh, the idea that the bridge should be a destination that people are drawn to it, don't just drive through it or fast quickly ac across it, but actually create a pause moment. Um, idea of communicating resiliency through the bridge form. Um, I asked about a gateway, again, it's a more focus on yes on the east, maybe not so much on the west, but certainly the center has some opportunities. Um, a desire to reduce the pier mass, and again, the importance of vertical clearance on the underside. Uh, in terms of views, others said, instead of the idea of just clear views, think about it as a curated view. So a focused view and intentional views as opposed to just open. Uh, provide public benefits to all users. In fact, this group said, maybe consider modifying the criteria to be more focused on users rather than the way it's currently set up. So if you go from a user standpoint, that's another way to maybe s establish the criteria. Um, I think this said something about the MAC station, a focus on the opportunity that not having a MAC station might bring. Uh, connect, focus on some connectivity to the street network, again, focused on the users. And think of um, maybe less so about particular events because they're, ir or they're not as common as common uses. What, what happens routinely day to day? And this is the last group. Um, again, another focus on the center of the city as a theme or the moment. So really put some energy into creating a moment. The fact that this is at the center of the city and the center of the bridge could be that moment. This idea of views and belvedere's was really important. Seating and creating more pause moments, especially on the west side where it's steeper. Um, and use the underside, especially at Waterfront Park, is this idea 
of being an asset to drive activity in life. Uh, not just focusing on the look of it, but also thinking about acoustics and seating, and then uh, focusing, uh, focusing again on the pedestrian scale and details, as well as that structural view from distance. Pretty comprehensive by a lot of people, so thank you. Um, so anything that people, sorry, I'm just like, it's very tight tonight. I don't know why. It's so we're, um, so anybody want to add anything to the, what Steve just talked about? Um, I just want to clarify the Max station comment. So on our tour, um, we were told that the Skidmore Fountain Max station was going to go away. And so um, while it doesn't really impact how the bridge is designed per se, it is something to think about how it'll, how the underbridge will function when it's no longer a Max slows down and makes a station, Max is going through, it's more through track and active track. Mm -hmm. And so there may be other agencies may want to coordinate, like how does, how does it all work under there when that little change is made? And then what does the, the, the experience of the bridge is really going to be more um, two feet, two blocks away on either other Max stations, you'll have a view of the bridge and what's that like. People will be staying at those stations and standing and looking, so. Yeah, definitely. Other thoughts about this criteria? Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everybody, for doing that work. Um, so we're going to hear from Cassie then for the next part of this um, criteria. Thank you. I'm uh, the word that stuck was curated from that for me. Really love that. Just how we are going to curate a whole experience on this bridge with this project. It's cool. I like that. Um, so I had urban site context and experience with the focus on context and surroundings, urban context, as well as pedestrian and cyclist connectivity. So. Um, what we heard was openness and view shed, um, the sort of working area of the industrial east side and that whole vibe and lending to what that feels like. So cohesion with that. Function meets style. So we, we talked quite a bit about the function that this bridge has to serve. Um, it's a piece of infrastructure that supports us in, in a lot of ways. But how can, that, how can we do that in style and be thoughtful about that? Um, optimizing for use, a lot of conversations around um, optimizing the space that we have for different modes um, and you know, in the current use, in the future use, after an earthquake, all the different things that the bridge has to do and serve. Um, so responsive to the future and innovation, how the community evolves um, and its uses. We also talked about um, the human experience from a texture and art standpoint from all the different modes. So I think you talked about that, Steve, too. Um, and the continuity, I think this is a really consistent theme of three bridges in one. How do we really make this cohesive from three bridges in one from two different neighborhoods into one holistic community? So how do we bridge all of that? How do we make that connect? Um, recognizing that um, we are a piece of e regional transportation infrastructure with aesthetics and a design wrapping around it. So everything that sort of hugs around the bridge. The, uh, we talked about enhancing, maintaining, and emphasizing the neighborhoods. How do we support them? How do we sort of emphasize them and not negatively impact them? Um, it's a human connector for the neighborhoods, the region, the river. Um, let's avoid narrowing our focus to one particular thing that, that it, in these processes it can be a little bit of a slippery slope if we get really caught around on one particular item or thing that we're particularly interested in that we need to keep a holistic view about all the people and all the experiences and all the stuff that this bridge needs to support. Um, one other, a couple other things up here because we popped around, but I thought was um, quite interesting is how does this bridge impact the other bridges? That was one of our th our sub bullet points was other bridges up and down river of us. So uh, you know, having a, a brand new bridge smack dab in among some other old bridges, um, some new infrastructure and some old infrastructure. Um, how do we become a, a friendly neighbor and family of bridges, all different but supporting each other's uh, different at positive attributes. 
um, and not taking away from them. Oh, uh, perspectives from within the neighborhood. So some conversations about how, um, how the bridge not only looks and feels as you're going across it, but you're standing from within the neighborhoods. Um, so that additionally kind of lending on that, not just from immediately within the neighborhoods, but also from further distances out. You know, when you're out at the Lloyd Center or you're driving from down the highway, you know, this is not just immediately what you're seeing and experiencing and the perspectives you have of the bridge, but from far out as well. Um, I don't know where it is on this list, but I want to further on that, that someone um, kind of emphasized that we're a visual marker in the city. We stand right at the center. We're the centerpiece of the city. So how do we not shy away from being that sort of, that, that centerpiece? Um, so we talked about angles, so how angles of the neighborhood meet angles with the bridge um, in those different neighborhoods, angles that make you feel safe, um, both on and under, um, wanting to play with the neighborhood and the view sheds, um, complementing, how does a form complement as opposed to conflict? So bringing with some of those angles, thinking of forms, how are we complementing that and not fighting that? Um, lighting, lighting uh, not just from perspectives away, but also underneath. S we talked a little bit about seating and, and places where you can view. Um, this is an interesting point brought up was location in terms of geography. So not just thinking that we're in the center of, of the city, but also in terms of the land underneath us. Um, so consider all the geography and, and, and the context as, as how it meets sort of the bend in the river or the different elements of, of the actual land that we're on. And I think I've hit most of them. So um, this was a, such a rich discussion and I, I really appreciate getting to facilitate this. So uh, I'll open it up to any questions, yeah, other any additions, thoughts people had about this? Yeah, anything anyone wants to add or questions? Everyone's like sugar rush after the <laughs> excitement of the small group breakouts. Okay, great. Um, so then we will hand it to Carol and Carol's gonna talk about the visual aesthetics of the bridge, criteria A and B. Okay, um, I'm gonna kind of rush through this because I, I wanna get to all of it and each group had such impressive things to say. Um, TA and CS, all right, tight arch and cable stay, just so you'll know my shorthand here. Um, there was a lot of discussion and comparison in the first group about the two, and there were some concerns about a tight arch being a bigger barrier. It's rounded against angular buildings. Is it, you know, is it too massive? Will it feel claustrophobic stuck in there around the buildings of the east side? And a great point was made about the Fremont, which are so one of our monumental tight arch bridges, is open to the sky, and it's massive, but it gets away with it because there's all this space around it. I thought that was a great comment. Um, so would a cable stay make more sense in the context of the east side? And the telecom has openness and space around it too, very transparent. And to some, the cable stay feels like art and it does tie in with the buildings, whereas the tight arch would be a bump. So this, this group was ready to tackle the essential question of what bridge type. Um, the east side approach being such a different compositional uh, um, uh, context. And then, um, let's see. They also felt like the cable stayed seemed better for a tapering down toward the historic district, that the large element wasn't right beside uh, that historic district, uh, district, the TA being visually blocking less light, more shadowy, blocking the convention center, and then there was a little discussion about an Instagram moment, which everybody knows about those. Um, so which you know which bridge might be that? And uh, someone said we need a magic moment, and I thought that was a wonderful comment. We need a magic moment. Okay, 
and the base won't be seen on the inside, east side because it disappears in the buildings. So the second group got to talking about coherence of at the very largest scale all the way down to the details. And how do you pull that off? Do you design for the biggest pieces and how does that translate down to the human scale? Um, three bridges in one, it's, it's a real burden and a real challenge to tie those three languages together. Um, could there be repeating patterns? Can there be honest expression of materials so you're not forcing a material onto part of the structure that doesn't uh, deserve it or feel comfortable with it? How do we accommodate uh, some of the, we talked about the experience below deck and the safety and its occupiable spaces. We talked about that a little bit. And then um, the sound concerns about how to dampen noise and vibration. Um, the character of the neighborhood, considering uh, making it feel more holistic and less fragmented. Uh, transparency and lightness, not heavy. The Burnside Bridge feels like a castle now, and it is built in an Italian Renaissance style, so this one will be very different. And then the, uh, its own expression, don't mimic existing buildings, and this bridge will likely outlast the buildings around it, especially if the earthquake hits. Oops. And then there's the proportion scale of all parts. Uh, we talked a little bit in the third group about the elements of the bascule and the sheer mass of what it takes and that big footprint sitting in the river as it does now. But could we see the massive machinery movement? Is it possible that that could be expressed outside of it and maybe you, you uh, get less overall mass when you don't enclose it? I thought that was interesting. Uh, you, no one wants to, let's see, uh, the cable stay might be an imposing structure on this skyline. There's many ways to design that. Um, it's difficult to get an elevational view of the, of the bridge itself, and the east side is going to melt into the context of the buildings that are there. So uh, no Godzilla muscling its way between buildings. That's a good one. Aesthetics definitely matter. Still some discomfort with the idea of not having cost weighing in at this point. Um, and then, again, continuity, bridge reads as a single design. Uh, recognize that there is sort of a Frankenstein diagram right now, so, and uh, I won't read some of these other comments that were rather humorous, but not appropriate for the big group. Uh, integrity across. <laughs> I won't say who, who said those. Um, but the superstructure will be seen from all over the city, not just over the river, but there's a kind of difficult aesthetic composition challenge here that the largest part of the bridge is not over the river. And it, uh, it almost is nonsensical that way, the biggest part of the bridge is over the freeway. So how does that influence the overall composition to it? Um, good points made about the pedestrian experience can be turned into educational experience and that that story pulls you along the bridge. Um, uh, the Burnside Bridge provides structure and is mindful of people below. This one can do the same. Um, oh, the attitude of the Markham Bridge is it doesn't care about any of this. It just cares about getting the people across, or the cars across. People are inside the cars, but nonetheless, uh, it's probably one of the most congested bridges that we have. Um, scale, urban intimacy versus the larger city scale, iconic over the freeway. Some of the best views will be from the freeway. And then uh, one question about do the new bridges all look pointy, and we just did that little diagram there for a second. And they don't want it to look exactly like the Tilikum. We don't want the big me or the mini me or anything like that. Uh, and the cable stay should be distinguished in Portland. Leverage the expertise of this engineering team, bridge architects and construction coming together, because not all projects are, are run that way. And this is the synthesis of all these disciplines coming together and doing it holistically, which is great. So, uh, okay, is that it? That's it. All right, yeah. all right. anyone wanna add anything? Did we miss anything? Yeah? I'll say one thing. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, in listening to those comments, it made me think uh, that 
Uh, I just want to go on record and say that I look forward to the point at uh, sometime in the future when uh, the I-5 is buried and we find uh, all new uh, activities and exciting uh, in engagements uh, under the river on the east side. So I know um, we're almost out of time, so I just wanted to highlight some of the things that we've not yet heard in the other three groups. We also shared um, themes that we've already heard tonight about prioritizing the pedestrian experience, um, making sure that um, the materials that are really used at that human scale are really high quality, rich, have that permanent feeling, um, ensure that uh, walking across the bridge really feels safe uh, in, and accessible, minimize shadows, minimize the feeling of being in a cage, um, and um, maximize the views and not ever really feel closed off from the rest of the city. We also heard um, also as well the theme about cohesion and connectivity and how this bridge ties um, the city together and also that it's the geographical center, so how can we reflect that in the design somehow? And it is a unique aspect of this bridge versus any other bridge, so how can we elevate that and highlight that? Um, so a couple things that we haven't heard that I wanted to highlight is um, there's an interest in somehow paying homage to the existing bridge through art. Um, it, it, there's just some ideas that were thrown around. And then also a lot of the criteria as it's written now talks about minimizing impacts and um, the, our, the groups uh, really talked about changing that language to talk about enhancing other features and how can the bridge enhance and improve um, with its design versus just uh, minimizing, especially when it comes to natural resources. Um, one other, I think the last thing I wanted to highlight is that um, there's an acknowledgement that on the east approach, there's a very clear experience to be had you know, with the large um, long span structure type. So how can we complement that with a similar compelling experience on the west approach? So maybe with the seating or the Instagram moments or um, the pause moments. So just ensuring the experience is balanced on both east and west approach to kind of um, uh, play off this symmetry, the asymmetry that this bridge will will definitely be. Uh, be. So, and yeah. um, thank you, Brandy. And if yeah, please let me know if there's any anything else. Awesome. Anything to add? Any questions? And Megan, I want you to just hold on to the mic because I think you'll have a part here in a minute. Yeah, Brad. So, um, th this criteria also enumerated in kind of a just a uh, easy way, Portland values, and I think. For me, that's the most paramount thing in anything that I'm seeing here. And that, that requires some real um, breaking that down and thinking about what that's going to become as criteria. And, and, and I'm offering up as an example that the other bridges that we've had in the city, several of whom um, had no aspiration or uh, inclination to acknowledge time. I'm going to get across that damn river. I'm going to head up to Vancouver. I'm going to go down to California. That's the Markham. Um, this bridge is going to be here. It has been here for a long time, and it will be here for a long time. And the city wants to be here for a long time. And how does this bridge embrace the sense of evolution or that it's things are evolving? Uh, Brian, your, or Aaron, your point was ex uh, excellent to, to bring that up. That. The city is going to change on east and west side. Um, you know, Carol, you mentioned that too. So we can't anticipate exactly what that's going to be. But the attitude that you take of in, in the criteria, I think, should be paramount to what those values are, how we want to articulate at this point in time, in the, in the arc of time, where were we in 2023, 2028? Um, uh, establishing the values of this bridge and how do we respond to it at all scales. I had two comments. One was the, um, I don't think that the idea of being able to show the mechanisms working to people um, was, it seemed like there was a lot of people who liked that idea, but I didn't really hear it expressed very much from the facilitators. 
So, um, and then also the brilliant idea that I came up with after um, Brian talked about lighting was I like the idea of paying homage to the past, which we could do maybe through the sort of exposed uh, mechanisms working, so people could see that. Um, but the future too, because what if we had like projected above the bridge in the middle of it, a lighting display that would have like a virtual compass, like a holograph type of thing or something that people could come from everywhere to see. It would make the bridge iconic and it would also um, display like visually the fact that it is the center of the city, east, west, north, south. And if you had some kind of a compass where no matter where you came to it, you could see where you are in relation to like the other parts north, south, east, and west of the city. That's nothing that I know of that anybody has anywhere, and I'm sure we have the technology and the lighting stuff to do something like that. Cool. I see Ian has put up his heart, and then maybe Jackie. Um, one thing that uh, I, I have thought about and then neglected to remember when we were in group discussion, especially about the, the on-bridge experience, we live someplace that's very rainy. I walk across the bridges a lot. If I get stuck on the Hawthorne or the steel bridge and the lift goes up and it's raining, I'm grumpy. <laughs> like, so, so there needs to be a place to be out of the rain for pedestrians when the bridge goes up. Um, Um, someone, there was a statement about like the bridge, you know, about things being pointy or not being another Tilikum. And I was thinking about that because like when the Tilikum came up, I was very excited about it. I think it's very beautiful, but it's also for me has been completely inaccessible. Like it's really far south. I don't go over there. I'm not going to drive over it. You can't drive over it. You can only go over it by pedestrian or biking or, you know, um, or public transit. I don't have any reason to take public transit or walk or bike over that bridge, so I haven't since it got built. And so I feel like this bridge is more of the people's bridge. It's more accessible. It sits in the middle of our city. Um, it's where I think a more diverse population of folks are gonna use it. Um, so I love the idea of having sort of that um, tide arch. Right, because I thought like it was such a beautiful bridge over there, but it's a bridge that I don't access. Like it's a view I get, but I don't access it. I don't get to inter interface with it. So when someone said that, I just thought, I thought, yeah, but it's not accessible to most people, right? And like this bridge is in the center of our city and has its accessibility. And I, I just hope it really is beautiful, you know, because we do want it to last and it is going to interface with these other buildings on either side of it. And it is going to kind of continue on or maybe lead us into um, the flatter portion of the bridge. So, um, yes, cable stay. Am I saying that? I always, I'm saying the wrong one each time. So, the pointy one, yeah. <laughs> the pointy one. Yeah, because I, I just think it's such a beautiful bridge and I, and I just, I was so excited about the Tillicum and then I felt like it's so inaccessible to me. But the Burnside is like a very accessible and so I really want to have that beauty where you know, everyone gets to enjoy it and has the views and the shadows and the, the play with the, the east side, so. Wonderful, thanks Jackie. Any last thoughts? Um, we, as mentioned before, I will take photos of all this and email them to you, but don't worry, you don't have to read everyone's handwriting, we will type it up, um, so, but that will take a little bit longer. So um, we wanna get you something right away so that you can take your comment cards home or you know, if you took notes tonight to go back and just think about anything. I know sometimes it comes to you at like 3 a.m. like, oh, I wish I would've said that thing. So um, please send your comments to us, to me by email by December 1st. And if you ever just want to talk through it if, instead, if you don't want to email, that's totally fine too. Just maybe let me know and we can, we can talk through it. Um, so as mentioned, we won't meet again until January. So we really want to collect everything by December 1st so that the technical team can take it off and draft it up so that in January you can see something and reflect on that and talk about that. So I do want to just kind of, we're wrapping up the meeting and um, there's Megan, I was like, where'd you go? Um, so we are still deciding on the date of the January meeting, is that right? 
I think we're leaning towards January 18th. Yeah. And Megan, do you want to tell us why we're still late? Yeah, I, as mentioned in the previous meeting, we really thought we should uh, put another meeting on the calendar to really um, allow more time to wrap up this uh, step in the process. So the primary purpose of the meeting in January is to really come back, look what the team has, uh, how the, look at how the team has collected and infused your comments into the new um, draft of the document. But also, oh, it's, no, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Mail to you, so sorry. No problem. I have it in my head, and I have it in front of me, kind of here. I just wanted to also mention that we're really excited um, that also at the January meeting we'll be bringing in the bridge architect and the contractor to um, do a little meet and greet and um, have them talk a little bit about themselves and of the project. So we did select Beam Architect. Uh, architecture as the bridge architect for this project. Uh, they're based in the UK, so um, we're you know we don't have we don't get them over here all the time, but we're really excited um, to bring them over for this group. And then also uh, the contracting team, which is a joint venture between Stacy Whitbeck, Trailer Brothers, and American Bridge. Um, we'll have a, the project manager and the assistant project manager also come in January to say hello. You can ask them any questions um, about their thoughts or approach of the project as well. So we'll be budgeting time in the January agenda for that. So we're looking forward to that. Okay, success. Yay, Yay. All right, so there's the, there's the pretty pictures um, up there for Beam. And, um, and we'll just do this. Yeah, thanks. Um, and so, yeah, so it'll be exciting to get them here um, in person and chat with them. And, um, yeah, so we'll let you know as soon as we can. That's why the date is still a little bit up in the air, just to make sure that they can both be here. Um, and that's it. So really just make sure that um, I'll send you an email with the, with the notes, the rough notes here. You'll send me back your comments by December 1st, which is a Friday. And then we'll be off and running um, for January's meeting. So thank you all so much. I hope you have a wonderful and safe end of the year. And, um, and we look forward to moving forward into 2024. So thank you again for all your work. We'll see